So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Evan Bradley. I am the Chief Financial Officer for Campbell Property Management and one of the five partners of the company. I also work very closely with some of our largest clients on the major issues facing their associations. Uh, for those of you not as familiar with Campbell, we've been in business since 1953 and manage over 400 condo and HOA association clients from Dade to St. Lucie counties. Also with us today, we have Ben Messerschmidt, of Epic Forensics and Engineering, and he is a licensed engineer, as well as Michael Kassauer of Frank Weinberg and Black, an association law firm. So Ben, would you like to start, introduce yourself and the firm a little bit? <clears throat> sure, absolutely. Thanks for the intro and thanks for the pretty correct, correct pronunciation of my last name. That doesn't happen too often, so I'll take it when I can get it. Um, so we are with Epic Forensics and Engineering. We are very true to our name of being a forensic and engineering firm. Uh, mainly utilizing our forensic knowledge and our forensic eye to go ahead and find the root causes of issues to ultimately avoid those similar mistakes on the design, on the engineering end. So it's a little bit different than just a traditional design build of a new project, so to speak. Um, we're multidisciplinary, so full service within house, and certainly over 90% of our clients are going to be in the condo and HOA realm. Uh, and we specialize with that market. We understand the, the pushes and pulls within there as well. Thanks, Ben. Mike, would you like to introduce yourself and the law firm a little bit? <clears throat> Absolutely. Thanks so much, Evan. So my name is Michael Cassow. I'm a partner with the law firm of Frank Weinberg and Black. I am a board certified expert in condominium and plan development law. That's the Florida Bar talking. I'll let you decide whether I'm an expert, but that is the Florida Bar's designation for me. Um, I'm with a mid-sized firm that is located throughout the state of Florida with our primary headquarters in Broward and Palm Beach counties. Also have office in Volusia County, as well as a satellite office in Austin, Texas, which is a, a story unto itself for another day. But nonetheless, the, our firm is a full service law firm. Uh, we have a large portion of our practice dedicated to the representation of condominium and homeowners associations. I would say probably around 35, 40% of our practice is dedicated to that area of practice. Uh, candidly, to groups like this, I brag about the other 60% because one thing you learn about very quickly when you get on a condo board of directors or an HOA of any meaningful size is that you're a business. That's the bottom line. The name of the entity may have Condominium Association or Homeowners Association Inc. at the end of it, but you're going to have employment issues. You're going to have construction issues. You're going to have every category of legal issue pretty much that you could imagine for any substantial business. And when you have those issues arise at our law firm, we have condo specialists when it's pure condo issues, but when you have an employment issue or something that is more of a, a narrow specialty, uh, you get specialists in that particular area. So you're going to have a, a thoroughbred construction attorney reviewing your construction contracts. You're going to have a thoroughbred employment attorney dealing with your employment issues. The firm has been around since the early 1980s and condo HOA work has been uh, the one of the focal points of our practice since its inception. Um, I have been with the firm for about a decade now, and I'm pleased to say that 98% of my life is dedicated to representing community association throughout the state of Florida. So Evan, Campbell, Ben, thank you for allowing me to present with you guys today on this critical issue that I know has really been at the, the heart of a lot of people's concerns, honestly, in our world for years and decades, but, but especially since Surfside, I know we all want to give this the attention it deserves. Thanks, Michael. So just a reminder, this is for informational purposes only. This is not legal or engineering advice. If you have sp specific questions about your community, please reach out to your association's counsel or a uh, licensed engineer. We do encourage everyone to take advantage of the Q&A feature that's part of Zoom. Uh, Ashley covered it a little bit earlier, but please limit your questions to information about the course material. Again, questions about your individual situation are gonna be beyond the scope of our presentation today and we just can't get into all those uh, little details. So moving on to our agenda, we are going to talk a little bit about Surfside. There were some questions about that. We're gonna get into reserve studies, uh, the frequency and type of engineering inspections, uh, planning for the projects that ultimately will result from these things, funding these projects, we're going to take a little bit of time to educate on concrete restoration, and then whatever time we have left, we will try to get through the Q&A as it uh, shows up in the chat. Again, a reminder, please don't ask at my building, can we or when will or, or rumors or is this legal? Again, we're just not going to be able to address that today. It's going to be a uh, general education for the benefit of everybody here. Um, so we appreciate you uh, complying with that. So let's talk a little bit about Surfside. Uh, obviously an incredibly terrible tragedy, at least 98 people uh, confirmed deceased 
uh, our thoughts and prayers really go out to those affected by that. And, and those are, uh, people are obviously still dealing with all the repercussions from that. So we just want to acknowledge what, how horrible that was. And, and we appreciate that a lot of you are probably here uh, because of that event. So let's kind of get into a little bit about what, uh, you know, what impact that's had on, uh, on the condo and association world. And I, I can tell you from the management side, um, we've absolutely seen an, an uptick in people looking into getting engineering studies, people working with engineers that were already engaged, um, taking a much more serious look at, uh, at their structural issues. And uh, I think the boards and uh, the management companies all uh, are taking a much more serious look at, at reserves and uh, they're will I'm much more willing to spend money. At least that's what we're seeing on our side. Uh, Michael, what are you seeing in terms of legislation or discussions at the city county level uh, related to this? So as far as direct action that we've seen thus far, Evan, I think that the action indisputably is occurring on the city level and the county level thus far. Um, we've seen some municipalities uh, decide to take matters into their own hands. I can tell you that I've seen some action, I believe, uh, predominantly when you get to Palm Beach County in particular, uh, City of Boca Raton is at the forefront of, of taking some municipal action. I think City of West Palm Beach has been, has been also moving a little bit to try to get, get some inspection requirements in place. Things that come close to uh, following the path of the Miami and Broward 40-year uh, inspection requirements. It's not verbatim, but it's in that same theory of getting your, your building inspected. Um, on the state level, I can tell you that I am part of the, uh, the real property section of the Florida Bar which has created a special task force that is currently working with legislators in Tallahassee to try to see if we can get something done with the Condominium Act to maybe establish some sort of, or elsewhere um, beyond the Condominium Act, candidly, in Florida statutes to potentially uh, address these issues. The, the two big areas that you're seeing though are basically inspections and reserves. And these are very, very controversial issues and I'm not going to forecast the probability of legislation passing on the state level, um, especially when it comes to reserves, you can put yourself into a situation where you are battling against a pretty powerful lobby when it comes to um, real estate developers and builders who generally do have an interest in trying to uh, keep the, the, the assessments low. And obviously, if you have uh, expensive reserve requirements, that can make it more challenging to keep reserves low. So to answer your question directly, Evan, cities doing things right now. Palm Beach County, I can tell you that they are already putting out some voluntary guidance as recently as last month, saying that they want to see people doing things about every 25 years. And I can, I can share that, that guidance that went out from the, the, the county um, and the building official with anybody that would like, but they have not passed any sort of county level ordinances yet. But I do hear that is in the works and maybe coming from Palm Beach as well. And one more thing I would like to go ahead and tag on there real fast is that even like the city of Aventura, for example, they've also um, up their requirements too, as of late. So really adding additional qualifications of those individuals involved to go ahead and perform some of these inspections, which I think is what we're going to expect to see with any future legislation that's going to be coming forward. All right. And the city of Aventura actually has a requirement now that any engineering report obtained uh, actually has to be turned into the city. I think it's within 48 hours. So that, that actually has passed and, and been implemented. So if you are in the city of Aventura, be, be aware of that. Um, Michael, there's some questions about uh, responsibility and exposure for boards. I mean, I think some of those are obvious, but I mean, what, what could you say to boards who are concerned that, that maybe their residents don't want to spend the money or, uh, you know, how would you talk to them in the wake of this tragedy? So there are two things that I'm going to break that out into in broad strokes. There is A, what the board should be doing. Uh, what their duties are under the governing documents as an, and as an association which they are in control of. Secondarily, there's a question there about individual liability, I think, of individual board members. Um, am I going to be sued as the, as the director of Condominium Association, Inc., because I didn't do my concrete restoration project? So let me break that out. Every single association in the state of Florida has a duty to maintain its common elements. Full stop. And the board of directors is the ones that makes the fundamental decisions. They set the policy. They decide on what contract needs to be executed, what, what professionals need to be retained. So that duty exists. And every board member, I believe, is for the most part and should be taking that quite seriously. Um, if they are not complying with that duty, if, you know, that, that beautiful structure you see on your screen right now has chips of concrete falling from it. I think that the association could be vulnerable to a legal challenge for failing to maintain common elements. 
That does not necessarily uh, equate, though, to individual liability of a director. Uh, and I know that directors get threatened with lawsuits from, from their people all the time, their community all the time. That's part of putting yourself out into the public sphere to some degree, rightfully or wrongfully. Um, but what I would say is that it's unlikely in most instances this is a matter of individual liability for, for um, directors, although it really is something you need to discuss on a case-by-case -case basis because, number one, that doesn't even come into play for, for me for the most part if you can genuinely say that the board of directors was relying on the advice of a qualified uh, a professional in the area. A guy like Ben Messerschmidt is somebody like that, and if Ben's giving guidance to the board, I think that that's pretty strong stuff when it comes to whether the association's taking proper action, so long as, of course, they're following his advice. Uh, beyond that, though, individual liability as a general rule, and again, talk to your lawyer on a case-by-case -case basis, you're talking about things like fraud, self-dealing, unjust enrichment. I don't think there would be, in most instances, that type of scenario at play. So what I would say is that if it's getting to a point where you can tie it back to an individual benefit for the director, then, then that's more in play. But as a general principle, these are maintenance issues, and they should be dealt with through the association rather than lawsuits against individual directors, generally speaking. Thanks, Michael. So Ben, unfortunately, or fortunately, this is Florida. And, and after hurricanes, we see roofers and other vendors all of a sudden pop up out of nowhere. Uh, are you seeing engineers or consultants coming out of the woodwork that maybe aren't as, as reputable in the, in the wake of Surfside? Unfortunately, yes. Uh, I mean, to put it very, very short, um, I, I'm not surprised by it. I mean, given, given the fact I'm, I'm a true South Floridian, so, uh, I mean, it's also rich in the history of, of South Florida and development down here. Um, and, but one thing that is very important to go ahead and that any board and any association should consider is look at their individual track record. Look at the individuals that will be completing the work. Have they done this before? What licenses do they have? Are they doing it all in-house or are they solely having one technician do the evaluation and subbing out a threshold inspector or a third-party engineer to sign and seal. I mean, wh where we currently are now is an environment that does allow that to happen, unfortunately. I don't think that's going to be happening in the near future for a very good reason, but certainly be aware, be mindful. I mean, lean on your property management team 100% to go ahead and be the first level of vetting, so to speak, because they have a high bar to even be a vendor. They need to have certain insurances and thing and insurances, licenses that they have to at a minimum hold. And they also have a working relationship with these professionals. So use that as your first resource. But, and, but I would definitely be wary of pr certain prices that may seem too good to be true. Um, and individuals that may be saying they can do something when in actuality they can't. And there's no way to back it up. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, great, great advice. And unfortunately, Florida does have a rich history of that sort of thing. Yeah. So the next topic we want to talk about is reserve study. So the reason this is kind of first on the agenda uh, after Surfside is, is really the first step to wrapping your arms around whatever upcoming projects you might have. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware what a reserve study is, it is uh, either an architect or, or an engineer um, will come out and survey your entire property. They're going to look at all of the capital items that you have, and they're going to list all those out, and they're going to give you a realistic useful life remaining, a realistic replacement cost, and realistic uh, numbers for how much your association, association needs to be putting away annually uh, to cover those costs. So that is a, very, a relatively inexpensive way for the association to quickly digest all of its different components and uh, anticipated expenses in the years coming up. Um, Michael, what does the law say about reserves for condos? <clears throat> so one thing that usually shocks people is that there aren't really any specific requirements with the frequency of, of an association obtaining a reserve study. So there's a difference between what the law requires and what is good practice. I think that, that, that people that are smarter than I in this area like Ben would probably say that every two to three years would be ideal. Um, and so something, something along those lines, you know, to make sure that you're on top of the economic and useful life remaining on your property is something to seriously, seriously consider. Um, but when it comes to reserves beyond that, statutorily under 718, the default requirement is to fully fund reserves. So that's the default, fully fund reserves. Um, if you haven't taken any action, otherwise it's going to be under the straight line method as opposed to the pooling method. 
I won't go in any deeper than that because that's a whole separate conversation of straight line versus pooling, but no, fully funded is the default. But of course, as most people here probably know, you can opt out of that default with a supporting membership vote, majority of the owners at a quorum meeting of the members. And that's a really, really, it's one of the few ones I can say where getting the membership vote is not as hard as it is in other instances, because who the heck wants to vote or not vote to raise their assessments? Um, so at the end of the day, that is something that the default under Florida law is that you are fully funded, but the owners can and often do either opt out of fully funded in full or in part, meaning partially funded or waiving the reserves. Um, I did hear a line the other day, I got to use it again, and Ben's going to smile because he may have heard me hear this line the other day, um, but I love it. It's, you know, every time an association decides that they're going to waive reserves, they're essentially pre-approving a special assessment. The money's got to come from somewhere, and typically it's easier and cheaper to deal with these problems now rather than kick the can down the road and potentially have the conditions exacerbate. And then, of course, you need to supplement your funding with a special assessment. So, Ben, uh, what you know, you you perform these reserve studies. Kind of, why don't you give us a little bit more color on what's included and maybe what's not included in the reserve studies that you guys do? Sure, absolutely. Um, so, with what we do, I mean, it's going to be with respect to the reserve studies is going ahead and evaluating any equipment that needs replacement over. I think the threshold is ten thousand dollars. So, if it's less than ten thousand dollars, then it really is exempt from that. But correctly to your point, Evan is is really looking at the remaining useful life and replacement costs. It is establishing a snapshot in time of what that equipment looks like. Now it's solely used for budgeting related purposes. And also a lot of times we see individuals that are coined as reserve specialists are that are doing the reserve studies more often than engineers and architects. Now to, to meet that threshold, it's really just experience. Um, and the backgrounds of those individuals are mainly financial based and less engineering and practical. So you can imagine that the condition analysis and condition assessment of those components are more from the financial only section, as opposed to looking at the individualized components and whether or not they could be repaired instead of replaced. Take an RTU, for example, a rooftop unit providing air conditioning to your common corridors. Certain compressors go bad. They have multiple compressors. You can just plug and play, swap that bad one out, put it in. A traditional, I'm a lack of a better term, I'm just gonna simplify this, but an accountant may not be qualified to go ahead and provide that information. Sure, it's easier to go ahead and replace, but that may not be the answer every single time. So really the thing that is missing is that the analytical approach or engineering analytical approach, I should say, to let you know what that condition is. Because yeah, they have calculations saying concrete is good for 50 years. That's, that's, that's the baseline and the building is 30 years old, so you have 20 years left. Is that really a, a thought out number? Not really. I mean, from an engineering standpoint of things, I mean, if repairs are done along the way, that number could be drastically less. So there's, a, you have a lot more, you can have a comprehensive conversation by having something that's more detailed than just a reserve study. Reserve studies should be known for, for what it is, and it absolutely provides value. Do not get me wrong. It certainly sets the baseline for what an association should do. And to echo Michael's point of it's common to, for associations not to go ahead and fully fund for a variety of different reasons, they are not, the, the reasons aren't substantive in the nature of the issues that are on the property. They are substantive with respect to the, the demographics, the PR, the inner workings, the network the people network of these communities. Um, and they are in the driver's seat at this point in time. All right. So Ben, we had a bunch of people ask about concrete restoration and making that part of your reserve study. Is that something you guys include or recommend including? We absolutely recommend including. I mean, if, <laughs> if, if my clients would allow me, I would be adding more items on there as well. I mean, operating budgets for, for attorneys, for engineers. I mean, it's very common that we have long relationships with our clients and they say, hey, we're going in a budget season. What should I be forecasting for you, Epic? And mm -hmm. I'd love to see that because too many associations are in a position when they say, oh my gosh, I have X, Y, Z problem. And now I need to go ahead and pay an engineer. And that's only one small aspect of it. It's, the engineer's not doing the repair. Right. The contractor's doing the repair. They may have money for the contractor, but they don't have money for the engineer. Right. So, so certain things like that, I mean, should be considered, but it comes at a cost. 
And it's whether or not the association wants to go ahead and undertake that cost and, and pass that on to their community, which is quite honestly, a very tough practical sell, especially when the entire community is not fully versed in the inner workings of how a condominium technically should be operating. Mm -hmm. So that kind of takes us into the next section, which is uh, the engineering inspections. Oops. So we, as you covered, kind of a reserve study is really not an engineering report. It's, it's just a list of the components and the useful life and the estimated replacement costs. And you don't have to be an engineer to conduct a reserve study, although you guys are and you add an you know, additional level of, of analysis to it. Um, so when should the association bring in an engineer? I mean, the easy answer is today. I mean, mm -hmm. if you can find one, um, quite honestly. Uh, and it, it's not to go ahead and say, all right, well, have someone like me on your property doing anything and everything just willy nilly. It's at least have someone that you can go ahead and call if and when you need it. Get through some of that contract minutia. So at least you can pick up the phone when you need to pick up the phone and say, hey, Ben, hey, Epic, hey, whoever, I have something going on. Let me just get your two cents on it at a bare minimum. Think about how, how a lot of individuals down here, I mean, may have some attorney friends, may have some legal, may, may have some doctor friends. Think about your engineer as, as the management's available resource as an engineering friend and colleague to go ahead and answer some of those questions that may be above uh, the, the skill level of those individuals. So having one on, not essentially retainer, but for lack of a better term, a retainer is a wise decision for an association to undertake. All right. We had a bunch of questions, you know, how old should the building be before the engineer evaluates it? Or how often should it be inspected? How would you answer those questions? <clears throat> well, that's going to vary from property to property, as you can honestly imagine. I mean, you have to look at a lot of different factors of, I mean, starting from the first domino that could potentially fall. You're talking about the original construction methods, right? As part of what we do, I mean, we're evaluating properties that are as young as four to five years old. And those can have multi-million dollar defects. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have properties that are 60 years old that also have multi-million dollar defects that need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. So it is truly on a case-by-case -case basis. And a lot of different factors go into it. Think about just how an individual can go ahead and age over their lifetime. It's going to be dependent on a lot of factors. It's going to be dependent on how, what, what they're eating, how they're maintaining themselves. Um, how you're born. There's, there's a multitude of factors that, that come into play that should really be considered. Mm -hmm. um, but as a general basis, and, and I think this is the perfect way to tee up Michael, um, is from a time period using anywhere from three to five years, quite frankly, makes sense. And it doesn't have to be a full-blown assessment. You can still do something that's a baseline. So at least you know, and you've done your building's physical that's gonna be valuable knowledge, even just to go ahead and just tuck away and file for the association, provide it to the community if and when they want it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is there, a, is there a name for the type of inspection or are there different types of inspections that boards should be looking into uh, relative to their building's health? Sure, uh, the easiest terminology would be a property condition assessment. And you can use that as it's a purely visual approach. It should be in line with uh, corresponding ASTM, ASTM E2018. So that's really going to be the baseline for an assessment. And that's going to let you know what all your components are working at. So think about it as, I mean, that physical. So let's see where you are. And hopefully that report does open up fluid dialogue between the association and the engineer to say, okay, well, this is what we have. What do we need to go ahead and talk about and plan for the future? What's coming around the bend? And let's get ahead of it if we can. All right. So then uh, a lot of people are asking, what about hidden issues? You know, what about if I have uh, erosion underneath my building, perhaps? Or, uh, you know, is there radar type surveys that can be done? What, what do you have? How do you answer that? The answer is absolutely. And the, the, uh, the very optimistic view with engineering is that almost anything is possible in engineering. The, 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 the downside is, it's going to cost. <laughs> right. So, I mean, the more and more in tests you do, it will be costly. But engineering, give us an engineering-based problem. We can figure it out in a multitude of different ways. So mm -hmm. to go ahead and do testing of the earth, I mean, no problem. You get a geotechnical lab to go ahead and do some soil borings. 
you need to go ahead and do GPR, ground penetrating radar. They're testing companies that could do that. They're governing bodies, ASTM, ANSI, that have standard procedures. So if it is just gonna be certain items like this to test, there are a multitude of different test methods that can be utilized that are in excess of just a pure visual approach. And I would defer to your engineer as a first source to help you navigate and help the association navigate those avenues because quite frankly, they're not well known. I mean, any, any board member from, from any association can't just be like, I want to go ahead and do a, a roof survey. I want, to, I want to test the moisture underneath it. What sort of test do I need? They may not be qualified to do so, but there's entire manuals that get updated every two or three years of updated protocols, updated procedures that your engineer, if they're specific to focusing on buildings, and focusing on communities can absolutely help you. Right. So uh, I think the inspection most of us in the condo world are familiar with, Michael, is the 40-year inspection. So that is a requirement in Dade and uh, Broward counties right now. Can you tell us a little bit about what's required for 40-year inspections? So Ben is, ben is going to probably be uh, really good at helping you with particulars on this as well. But, but I, I, in broad brushes, what the 40 year inspection requires is for the association to conduct, um, inspe uh, conduct inspections primarily of their structural components and their electrical components, at least once every 40 years. And then every 10 years thereafter. Hey, I got it right, look at that. Um, and then it, <laughs> what, what, what ends up happening is as you draw nearer to that, um, to that 40 year mark and you conduct your inspection, as it says on the screen, with a licensed professional engineer or architect, um, you're hopefully not going to identify any deficiencies whatsoever. Hopefully you'll find out all good news. Our preventative maintenance program worked. And if you didn't have a preventative maintenance program, and especially if you're located anywhere near the water, you're going to have problems. It's almost a certainty. Um, but that being said, once you identify those problems, you have a period of time to respond and correct those issues. Um, I believe, um, and Ben, correct me if I'm wrong, I sometimes mix them up. It's 150 days in that, I believe, Day County and 180 in Broward. Um, or, or, and, and that is in order to cure those deficiencies. In reality, I think Ben would tell you it's not uncommon for things to go further than that. Um, it's not good, it's not preferable, um, but it does happen from time to time. Um, I think people probably saw since Champlain Towers, there were some, some colorful stories out there about neighboring condos that were 45 years old. They never did anything. So people blow, people speed on the highway all the time, but if you wanna follow the rules on this one every 40 years and then every 10 years thereafter, you should be looking into your structural and electrical, and then you have more or less about six months after you identify those deficiencies to, to bring the property into compliance. And even to, even to add on that, if, if I could, is, I mean, one thing that needs to be understood is that this is truly a minimum requirement in every sense of that term. I mean, look at that second to last bullet on the, on the page right now. Pose an immediate threat to life safety. That is it. So looking at it from a structural standpoint, I think, I'll give you a nice practical example. You have um, a elevated pool and right below it, you have a parking garage, a pool deck as well, right? So you have a column that is going vertically into that slab and that column looks terrible. You have white staining coming down, which is called efflorescence, indicative of water penetrating. You have cracks, you have spall. The 40 year research process will tell you how to go ahead and address that column. That's very straightforward as an engineer. You're going to go ahead and do what you need to do to fix that specific column. What it will not do is it will not say, okay, well, that water is coming from the pool or that water is coming from the pool deck. You need to replace the waterproofing within the pool or the pool deck to stop this issue. You see how there's a big difference? Mm -hmm. So by having a comprehensive inspection that even goes above and beyond, is really going to help you avoid those um, fix this year after year after year after year after a year example. Mm -hmm. and another important thing to point out is uh, I believe Champlain Towers was only 38 or 39 years old. I don't think it had hit its 40 year mark yet. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised at all if we get updated uh, legislation at the county level that reduces this down from 40 years to something closer to 25 or 30. And exactly. And one thing to even say on that further is that even if you're at that 30 year mark or 38 year mark, quite frankly, I think you're too late. Mm -hmm. I mean, to do a comprehensive review, 
is going to take time because you're going to start off as a stage approach of a visual first, and there will be issues in all likelihood. And then you do some destructive work and then you develop plans or no, then you meet with the association to figure out what recommendations do you want to be moved forward and then design occurs. Just those four steps alone take time, budget a year. And then now you want to go out to bid. In today's marketplace, these bids aren't good for longer than 10 days, as ridiculous as that may sound. And to get that bid, it's going to take you at least a month, maybe two. And I mean, please go ahead and, and try to bid out a job right now. It is tough. It is tough for us. And, and we get it. There's a lot of pushes and pulls in the labor market and the materials market as well. So you have to be able to budget at least a year, if not more, to lack of a better term, get your act together before you actually have a contractor on site. So considering to do your 40 year um, inspection requirements or fixing what is wrong or what may be wrong within that, at that milestone, in my opinion, it should be happening, give or take at that 35 year mark. Just get yourself ready for it because it also it does cost money. That money's gonna have to come from someplace. Getting those approvals are gonna take time. Getting the professionals involved like Michael, like Evan, like myself involved will take time. So, I mean, 38 is too late in, in my, my practical and honest opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we agree. So now we've identified that we have these projects. Kind of how are we, uh, we going to plan for it? So I think one of the most important things is involving the professionals like your attorney, like your engineer, like your management company uh, early and often in the process. Um, you know, Michael, you think you had some, some thoughts on this. You've helped associations through some, uh, some of these type projects. Absolutely. Thank you, Evan. And, and I'm actually going to take it one step further than, than Ben did before when he said, you know, when should you bring us on? And the answer was today. I agree with that. In fact, I'd even go further and say as far back yesterday as you possibly could. And here's why. Uh, and Ben really said a lot of it, you know, two seconds ago, but I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to add a little bit more of a legal uh, spin on it. There is so much that needs to be thought about when you are preparing for a project like this, from the engineering perspective and the legal perspective, to say the least, and the management perspective as well, because what ends up happening that I find to be the most fatal flaw that ends up causing the most unnecessary pain in these processes is lack of clarity at the outset and poor communication to the owners, all while you're asking them to spend millions of dollars a lot of the time. So it creates a very hostile environment um, and a lot, a lot of frustration within the community that is really being misdirected. Because at the end of the day, this is about maintaining a concrete structure. So it's not controversial. It's necessary. And it's something that does cost money. Of course, though, no, no, but everyone always likes to shoot the messenger. So boards end up taking a lot of flack. What I recommend is, like, like you were saying, Evan, bring all people like the three of us in on day one. You should bring your management personnel, your engineering personnel, as well as your, your legal counsel all into the fold because there's going to be a whole host of issues that come up along the way. For instance, if you don't have sufficient reserve funds, how are you going to fund the project? There's really just one choice at that point, or two choices rather. There's a special assessment or there's borrowing the money. Oftentimes for either of those, but especially for borrowing money, there might be a provision in your governing documents that says you can't borrow money from a lender unless the members vote to approve that loan. So think about that. If you can't, if you're not comfortable with a special assessment, the only option, if you don't have the money in the bank, is to go out and get a loan. And if you're going to do that, but you need a membership vote, that's going to take time. And not just time, but it's going to take coherent communication. And that brings me back to, again, the idea of getting someone like Ben involved on day one, because what Ben can do is two things. Number one, he's going to help you understand your issues in a way that you can discuss them in a clear way. Number two, him and I can stand at the front of the room, and I think we've both done this many times, you know, separately and together. Um, you know, we can stand at the front of the room together, and we can be your front line. We can take the bullets, and we can stand up there with our professional licensure, which doesn't mean everything to everyone, um, especially with lawyers. People have very strong feelings about us, uh, usually not good. Um, but nonetheless, we can stand up there with our licensure, our experience. You know, I love the phrase institutional memory of knowing the pitfalls that might come up. And we can lay it out for the owners in a way that is respectful of their concern and their hesitation on these issues. And when you do things that way and you're anticipating all the things that might arise, 
on the on the procedural level. And then, of course, ultimately, when you go to bid out the contract, bringing in counsel early on to maybe do a, a pro forma contract that goes out with the bid so everybody knows exactly what they're bidding on. These are the kinds of things that can make the process go a lot smoother in the long run. Yeah, you're going to get some hourly bills from people like me and Ben at the beginning, but this is the epitome of a penny's worth of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So bring your people together, forecast out all the issues that are in your declaration and beyond just what 718 has in a default, and be prepared to do it the right way and communicate it to your owners clearly so that they don't go frustrated and cause unnecessary issues in what is already a very complicated process on a construction and engineering level. Yeah, I think you said you said a lot of great points there, Mike. I mean, communicating with the owners early and often if, if you think you're going to have a big project is critical. Bringing the engineer and the attorney and the management company together before you go any further is, is huge. Uh, you know, you want the attorney to review the contract with the engineer. Um, you want the engineer to help write the spec and be your advocate, you know, the whole way through. You want to make sure you're using reputable contractors and your management company, your attorney, and your engineer are gonna know who the reputable contractors are. Um, people might, like you said, balk at some of these hourly rates, but these contracts are gonna be a million, two million, five million, eight million for some of these concrete restoration or more. And uh, when you look at what it costs to have a few professionals on your side, it's pennies, you know, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 in the overall scheme of things. Um, and, it, and it all just needs to be part of the project. You need to really factor those costs into that is part of the project costs, just like the restoration, just like the permits, your other professionals really need to be included in those costs. Uh, you wanna hold your town hall meetings and educate the owners before contracts are signed. Hopefully you're not in an emergency situation so that your experts can come in and explain the project and the necessity uh, and, and answer all those difficult questions for you because you're going to get a lot of difficult questions and none of you are attorney, not none, very few of you are attorneys or engineers. Um, and it's going to be hard for you to answer those questions and you don't have to, they will do it for you and they do a great job. So you know, just keep these things in mind um, as you're heading down this road. The earlier you can get in front of this stuff, the better. Um, there was a few questions, uh, Ben or Michael, and I, I don't quite know the answer. What happens if you get into an emergency, if you feel like you have an emergency repair situation uh, relative to your to your condominium building, can you skip the permitting process or is there a, an emergency process that you can go through if you think you've identified an issue? Yes, absolutely. I mean, if you have an emergency, you need to fix it right then and there. I mean, it becomes a, a ask for forgiveness scenario more than asking for, for, for permission, excuse me. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's plain and simple. I mean, you have to protect life. If I see a, an unsafe condition, I'm telling someone, I'm letting people know. And if, I mean, if nothing happens, I'm letting the, I'm letting the jurisdiction know. Mm -hmm. I mean, at a minimum, put up some shoring on, on areas of concern. Do something temporarily. Mm -hmm. Close down parking spaces. Do something to go ahead and at a minimum pr to protect the public, which is, I mean, a baseline requirement for, for the professionals involved on any community. And even as a, a professional engineer, like I have a, a moral obligation to go ahead and raise that red flag, whether I'm right. hired or whether I'm not hired, I have to do that. All right. And, and Michael, I think uh, some of the boards get wary. They say, oh, do we have to wait for the next board meeting? I mean, if they identify an emergency situation, that's not something they have to do, right? I, I agree wholeheartedly. And I, you know, I'm not, I don't have the engineering licensure that Ben does, but I share in the sentiment that there's nothing that comes before health safety welfare in my mind. Um, obviously, I'm very mindful of procedure and process, but at the end of the day, I think there is always authority for emergency meetings. It's not a power that should be abused, but I, you know, it's one thing I saw a lot during the early stages of the COVID crisis in particular. People were very focused on process sometimes, um, and I'm not trying to get into a political talk about COVID with what it is or anything like that, but the, the, the point at the time, the analogy at the time that I used a lot of the time was if there was a broken bottle at the bottom of the swimming pool, would we let people go and swim on top of glass because they had a right to use the pool as an owner? Of course not. We would, we would deal with it in an immediate fashion. We're not going to have anybody get hurt. So health, safety, welfare comes first. Notice things on an emergency basis. Ratify them after the fact if you'd like on 48 hours notice or more as applicable. But do what it takes to protect people. Full stop. All right. Thanks, Michael. So I think Michael got into this a little bit. You know, How do we fund these projects? I mean, at the end of the day, you really only have four sources of, of money in an association. You have your operating budget, you have your reserve funds, if you have them, you have the right to special assess uh, based on your documents, and you have the right to borrow money based on your documents. 
uh, as Michael stated earlier, don't assume you have the right to assess or the right to borrow um, unless you've had a, a review of your documents and know that that power rests with the board and, and doesn't require a membership vote. Um, again, one more reason to have the attorney early on. Um, do not be afraid of an assessment. I hear so many boards say, oh, we can't have an assessment. We're never going to have, we, we'll, we'll lose our seat on the board. We'll do this, we'll do that. You can't be afraid of an assessment. Like we stated earlier, you have a fiduciary duty to maintain the common elements of the building. Um, if your building needs work, uh, you have to put an assessment in. If you're a single family homeowner, you're used to an assessment you know, annually or, or every few years when something breaks in your home. These are not uncommon events when you own real estate. So you, you just have to communicate early and often that an assessment is coming and the necessity for it and use your professionals to do that. Um, don't avoid a project because you think an assessment's so politically unsavory because the alternative is far worse. And um, I would even add on that, Evan, would, I mean, if you had a roof leak in your house, you mm -hmm. fix it the next day, plain right. and simple. So, so if you had a roof leak in your in condo with hundreds of different unit owners, why wouldn't the same thing go ahead and happen? I mean, there's, there's been a misconception within the entire condo industry that, oh, come move into a condo. You don't have to worry about mowing your lawn and cleaning your pool and all the other fun homeowner tasks that that I'm sure a lot of us do on a daily basis or a weekly basis or should do at least. Mm -hmm. So that whole misconception, I mean, is not doing anything good for the condo industry as a whole. That's why I think that that term assessment is essentially a, a bad term right. um, because they just say, no, that's not what I was sold. I'm sorry. This is, mm -hmm. this is meant to take care of itself for whatever reason. And, and I get it. I, I get it. It's and in changing that mind state unilaterally is, is a mountain that, that, that we all have to deal with on a day-to-day on -day basis. Right. And remember the beauty of uh, living in your condo is you get to split these costs amongst dozens or, or hundreds of other people. If a single family homeowner needs to replace their roof. It's whatever, 20, 30, $40,000. Uh, you guys, as a condo, you split up, uh, you know, the roof, it might be 5,000 an owner, 4,000 an owner. I mean, it's still a great deal to live in a condo versus, uh, you know, living in a single family home in a lot of ways. So, uh, how you market the assessment is huge. And that's something your management company, engineer and attorney can help you with because we've done this lots of times at lots of places. We know how to explain these things in a way that people uh, appreciate them rather than uh, throw stones in some cases. So um, there, are there are bank loans for these type of projects, but those are almost always going to be secured with a special assessment. So it's really not a way around assessing the owners at the end of the day. Um, or you have to build it in your operating budget and that's gonna greatly impact the, the maintenance fees that people pay and your maintenance relative to your neighbors. So don't look at bank loans as some sort of uh, cure-all or, or free money for these projects, but they do exist and they can help lessen the, uh, the burden because you can stretch the payments out over time for owners who may not be able to come up with a five or six or uh, you know, four or five figure uh, special assessment. Um, Michael, we got some questions from people. Do unit owners need to vote on these projects? There's some sentiment that if the project is over 500,000 or over a million, that somehow the unit owners may need to vote on this. How, how does that work? So the answer is as a default under 718, a default, the answer is no. There is no membership voting requirement. But let me expand upon the default. There are dozens, if not more than dozens, maybe even over 100 proportions of 718 that say things like, unless the governing documents indicate otherwise to the contrary. Um, there are also things in there that are permissive, meaning that just because the statute addresses the situation doesn't mean the documents can't go further than that or deeper than that or more restrictive than that. So I will tell you that I have seen governing documents on a re fairly regular basis that include dollar figure thresholds. If you exceed them, that you should be getting a membership vote. Um, I don't know that that usually would apply to a maintenance situation. It's usually more of a capital improvement kind of situation. Um, but you could have a membership voting requirement for the power of specially assessing, power to borrow money. We talked about that a little while ago. So at the end of the day, by default, typically you don't need a membership vote to implement this project. But your particular governing documents may include provisions that do establish that type of restriction. So again, another reason critical to bring in counsel early on in these types of situations because um, they may help you anticipate some of these voting requirements. So you're not sitting there 39 and a half years hiring Ben, recognizing that, yeah, he can get you a report maybe in a few months, but at the same time, 
what are you going to do when you get the report? It's going to look great on a shelf and just, and just demonstrate that you're not prepared to deal with the situation at hand. So bring the team together early. And, and one other thing I just want to spit out, I should have mentioned it on the last slide, but you brought up bank loans. Another reason to address these things early is it's not just about the association getting a loan. Oftentimes, owners can pursue lines of credit or other types of financing individually. So give them the information. Let's give them that pressure release valve for them to explore their own options. Don't make them feel like it's a draconian board of directors coming down on them with the hammer of Thor and saying, we're going to foreclose on you if you don't give us $15,000 within 30 days. You, there are other ways to do things with a heart, with a mind, and, and with a little bit of forethought. All right. And then, you know, when you prepare a budget for a project like this, again, we, we talked about it earlier, but you got to think of it as more than just the project cost. You got to budget for your legal fees. You got to budget for potentially additional property management. Your property manager probably had a full time job before you tried to take, uh, you know, take the roof off and, and, and re roof or, uh, or go through concrete restoration. So um, you may need additional management services. Your engineering costs have to be factored in. Permitting costs have to be factored in. And then there's contingency. I think a lot of people don't appreciate how much uh, contingency you might need in a concrete restoration. So Ben, can you talk a little bit about, about what you see when you get into major concrete restoration work and, and how much extra people should put in their budgets? Absolutely. And I wish that it was a straight line calculation. And when you get into the restoration world, it is up, down, left, and right. And it is solely dependent on how well a building was maintained and prior to starting a new project, right? I mean, it's if you brush your teeth once every 40 years, how many teeth would you have at year 40? Not too many. So, but those contingencies can at least set, be set as a baseline from historical record by relying upon your engineer and also published standards to certain things like RS means, for example, certain estimating softwares that could be utilized. And there are industry standards for certain items. Restoration is going to go ahead and be on the higher end of those contingencies, some of which going up to about 25% on some items. Mm -hmm. Historically, we know that the biggest variability you're going to have are going to be on your hidden items and also things you can't visibly see. So it's going to be like your stucco, stucco debonding or delamination. That's really when stucco sounds hollow, like a hollow floor tile. Visually, it looks fantastic. And you can paint that thing all day and it's going to look great. But that is not, that is providing an unsafe condition potentially if it is just hanging off there. Stucco is not a structural member. It could break and it can fall off, for example. Another example would be getting into a balcony, um, chasing corrosion down. As part of doing a proper repair, when you are finding a corroded reinforcing bar, just using a simple, simple example, it should be, the corrosion should be removed on the entire length of where that corrosion is plus a few additional inches. So you have good steel to tie into, right? Now, what happens if you're just chasing that thing down and it's winding down this lovely little road and it goes, butts and ends right at the sliding glass door? That's gonna be a substantial repair. And that's, that can't be forecasted, really. Um, so it's, some of those scenarios may unfortunately come up, but the hope is that associations do their due diligence on the front end and do find a healthy balance of, how much engineering makes sense to go ahead and do to forecast some of these numbers and get those numbers up front and have a comprehensive bid form from, from the nuts and bolts of it to protect the association so you're not at the contractor's mercy if and when certain overruns occur. So I think, you know, just as a, as a baseline, you mentioned you could go as high as 25 or even 30% on a concrete restoration contingency. So if you're looking at a $4 million concrete restoration job, that's an additional million dollars just in potential extra work uh, that you, you have to factor into your budget. So uh, it sounds like a big number, but uh, from our experience, and I'm sure from Ben's, it, uh, it happens quite often and you need to account for that. And then before we go to the next slide, can I jump in on one other thing? Of course. So doubling back to that second bullet point from the bottom about the membership vote, I was talking before about forecasting out with quality legal counsel and engineering some of the, the things you might anticipate beyond just the simple concrete restoration aspect. I want to mention two other things that I see anywhere from 50 to 80 percent of the time associated with the concrete restoration, other types of work that tend to arise. Number one is paint. 
Uh, mm -hmm. You're typically, if you're doing a big concrete restoration pro project, you're probably doing a big painting project too. Mm -hmm. so not, it's both a, an expense and it's also an opportunity because a lot of buildings, you know, want to go from beige to a, a more whitish color scheme that seems to be all the rage these days. Um, so if you're going to be considering a color change, you need to be thinking about your material alteration voting requirement. The other thing is hurricane protection. A lot of times when people are going through a concrete restoration project, they start also thinking about the glass, the sliders, um, and, and the shutters, by the way, come into play also for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's a good time if you're going to be working on a curb of a, of a sliding glass door to potentially be thinking about, okay, do I want to switch to impact glass now? They might have to take out the whole uh, window system, in which case it's an opportunity because you're probably not going to be able to reinstall that same 20, 30-year-old slider. Um, maybe you want to go ahead and, and consider upgrading the impact glass. There are special uh, reduced voting threshold requirements for membership votes and sometimes even just a board vote to make that upgrade to impact glass. You also, and this is one that's really, really important that comes up so much and causes so much heartburn, address at the beginning what you want to do about shutters and get someone like Ben to advise you on what you're going to do with shutters because a lot of people have shutters on their building, they're used to having it, and they get very upset if they are not able to reinstall those shutters. And if you're saying, Michael, why would we want to prohibit the reinstallation of shutters? Well, number one, if you're doing impact glass, you already have a form of hurricane protection. That's not to say shutters are worthless, but that's a pretty strong one. Number two, if you just touched up your concrete envelope of your building, do you really want to be going in there? And I assume you use a drill, Ben, but you're the technical guy and drilling holes into the building over and over again to penetrate to allow for your, your, your shutters to be reinstalled on the building. There are uh, there is one uh, big division of condominium case called Pintuzzi that I looked to quite a bit where there was an engineer that opined in that case that it was not in the best interest of the concrete structure for people to be allowed to reinstall shutters. But you need to address this early on because that is a very controversial issue that comes up. And both material alterations and hurricane protections are other types of membership votes that could come into play when you're going for that very focused tunnel vision view of a concrete restoration project. And tagging one more thing too to that very quickly is that this whole process should be thought of or, or entering into a large scale project should be thought of as an exercise, at least on the front end, and understand the available buying power that each association may have. I mean, you get benefits of buying in bulk, but know, knowing and recognizing that it is an exercise that can be added and subtracted depending on what these numbers come back at and obviously consulted within, with your professionals is really gonna both make it an objective conversation with you and your community, but you will get solid direction on what makes sense to do now versus doing later. So like keeping those in mind, because if, if you wanna have your full wish list of items addressed, and let's just arbitrarily say it was a million dollars to go ahead and do that. But prior to this exercise, you already budgeted 2 million. Well, great, you're gonna do everything. Now, conversely, if that number comes back at $4 million, you might scale it back and be like, okay, well, Ben, Michael, what really makes sense to go ahead and do now versus later? Can we cut some stuff? And that whole exercise is healthy and needs to be done. So and I have this conversation too often with, with community associations is like when the numbers do come back higher than expected, especially in today's market, it's like, okay, guys, let's pump the brakes. Let's see what can be done here and what reasonably makes sense here. Thanks, Ben. So we, uh, we did have some questions about uh, what concrete restoration. I think, you know, we talk about it pretty flippantly because we're so used to it, but I'm sure there's some people on with us today that maybe are new to condo life and, and aren't as familiar with it. So Ben, can you kind of take us through what concrete restoration means and what it is? Sure. I mean, restoration, I mean, you're restoring the concrete. I mean, plain and simple. Uh, and just looking at the slide right here in front of us, a lot of things start out as a crack and yeah, everyone's heard the phrase concrete cracks and yeah, and it does in a certain manner. Now, if, it, if that crack extends to a certain point, then something more could be going on. Very similar to what we have on the, on the image on the screen now, is that you'll have corrosion occur. And corrosion is really just going to be the buildup of chlorides with oxygen on that ferric material. Ferric going to be meaning your steel embedded within the slab, your rebar. So if nothing is done over time, you can see the overall progression, which will ultimately end up in a small, in a spall. I mean, the crack's going to get wider more air and more potential water can get to it. And it just becomes an exponential uh, growth of those issues. So the restoration is tackling that amongst a variety of other um, facade based items. 
of your stucco, of your reinforcement, of your concrete, um, also of your window systems, your railing systems. So it is just the envelope. It is really the better way to go ahead and consider that. Okay. Um, actually, one question I have before we move on is there, we've talked a lot about waterfront, beachfront condos. Uh, what about condos out west? Is, is uh, this an issue out west as well? Absolutely. I mean, it's a no, no building or structure is exempt from any sort of maintenance and repair. I mean, if you lived in a single family home out in the middle of sticks, would you expect to go ahead and still paint your building? Absolutely. So, I mean, the, the only difference is, is that you're not considered uh, a, in a harsh environment as dictated by the Florida Building Code and other industry standards. So, yeah, you won't have that degradation at, like, at let's say, year five. You might have it at year seven or year eight. But nonetheless, you will still have to do some level of maintenance on your property and some level of restoration on your property. So I think, uh, you know, just kind of wrap up here with the concrete restoration. I mean, leak, leaks in the garage, like you talked about, um, you know, uh, rising salt water, spalling, um, you know, all, these are all the things that you guys look for ultimately uh, when you come out and, and, and do your visual inspection uh, of a building. So. We're kind of right up against the one o'clock mark here. And I think that kind of takes us to the end of our presentation. So, um, you know, just to summarize, it's important work with your building engineers, do thorough inspections, identify your risks. If you've worked with engineers in the past and maybe you're not, uh, you know, you want to have that re-examined, you may want to have a new, a new engineer, or the same engineer look at work that it was, has been previously done. Uh, we strongly encourage you to update your reserve studies if uh, you have them. Uh, because building costs have gone up substantially. If you've never had one, we really strongly recommend that you get one because that's the best way to kind of identify what's going to need to be done, when it's going to need to be done, and then you can start to formulate a three or five year plan in terms of both funding and project management. Otherwise, you're really just, just flying blind. Um, you got to do your preventative maintenance. That's something your management company should be working with you on. You should have preventative maintenance schedules. Um, you, sh you should have, uh, your people should be accountable for what they're doing daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly. Uh, if that's not happening, you are not extending the useful life of your, of your components to their maximum, and they may fail even sooner um, than what the industry might expect. And again, safety is our number one concern. It's mine, it's Ben's, it's Michael's. Uh, we can't stress enough that if you think you have issues in any of these areas, uh, address them as soon as possible. So, um, Again, we, uh, we do have a blog that uh, we've written articles about 40-year certifications and concrete spalling and Michael's contributed articles and uh, we'll, we'll make sure that Epic does as well. But if you want to get on our blog and, and look some of these things up, it is readfan.org and you can search, uh, search the blog for all the different categories of uh, industry-specific articles we've written and uh, we certainly encourage you to do that. Um, at this point, I think we'll go ahead and open up the Q&A and see if there's some questions here we can answer. Again, we're not going to answer any specific questions, um, but I'll try to moderate here and flip these over to, to Ben or Michael. So first question is, my building's undergoing concrete restoration. Uh, what do I tell my owners about the tile on the balconies needing removal? I guess they may have some, some decorative tile or something that may be laid down over the balconies. So Ben, what are your thoughts on tile on balconies? Well, tiles on balconies, I mean, can essentially act like a sponge, if you will, even though they're, the tile should be non-porous, but the grout below will be somewhat porous and it's going to just slow down the percolation and the movement of water from, let's say, your sliding glass door to the edge of the slab. It should be uniformly sloped out. Now, when you're doing concrete restoration, though, to that, that previous example I gave of chasing down the corrosion, you might be chasing it back straight through your travertine straight through your marble straight through whatever you may have so um that is what comes into play i mean it's it's a practical issue of just having more moisture there if you especially if you don't have any waterproofing on that structural level on that slab but when you're doing the repairs it will get damaged um, so we see certain associations either either remove it entirely or at a minimum remove uh that i guess that four foot edge, so to speak, if you were just go ahead and run that against the perimeter, because you have your railing post that comes in there, you have the edge of the balcony, which you're going to be fixing on multiple, multiple times throughout the building's lifespan. So you don't have to worry about those ancillary charges, basically, for putting in the new tile. 
um, we have to understand, and I'm sure Michael's going to go ahead and chime in, is that I mean, these balconies are a limited common element. So the association does have the right, and Michael, I'm putting on an attorney hat here, so, so hold me accountable here, is I mean, the, the association has a right to go ahead and maintain their property. And if that means that your tile has to go with it, tough luck. Yep. And that's another, thank you, Ben, for that. that that's another big issue to, to bring in competent counsel early on to identify because there's a couple things I'd like to say about it. Another provision that you should be looking for in your governing documents is whether or not you have something called an incidental damage provision. Um, the general thought out there is that if there's damage that is incident to the association performance maintenance responsibilities, meaning if I have to restore the concrete slab of that balcony, um, and to do that, I have to remove your tile that, that you paid for and you installed on that limited common element in most cases, um, then that is incidental to the maintenance responsibility. And by default, that will typically be a responsibility that falls back on the owner, meaning we're going to take off your tile and you have to pay for it. But some associations have something called an incidental damage provision, which says that if the association causes damage to your stuff, let's say, to be, keep it really casual, while they're performing their the association's performing maintenance responsibilities, that the association is financially responsible for that. Um, and that can also, by the way, just to take the analysis one step further, if you've tracked the division's rulings on this issue, another critical issue will be, even if you have an incidental damage provision to make the association responsible, did that owner properly get the association's approval when they installed that tiling? And if they did not, they could potentially forfeit that incidental damage for protection as a unit owner. And then also I want to throw out there because I've actually confronted this issue fairly recently. Think about the reinstallation part. You know, you get Ben to come out there and, and get, get a and supervise a contractor to do a fresh coat of waterproofing on your balcony. And then the owner doesn't install anything on top of it. I mean, again, this is me now getting out of my wheelhouse, but Ben, what happens if that owner waits a year before they reinstall uh, some, some balcony flooring on top of the fresh waterproofing? Is that waterproofing still going to be in good shape at the end of the year? It all depends on what was specified. And, and again, I mean, one thing I do often say is, I mean, type of waterproofing that you have does not sell more units and unfortunately does not bring elevated value, at least in today's market. So typically the most economical approach is taken. Then some of those even have, they'll break down within just UV rays. They need to be covered. So it, it's really very dependent material to material on what you utilize there. All right. So my and it's about who's responsible when it comes off, but then also thinking about process and giving people notice so they can pick their tile and get it reinstalled on top sooner rather than later so that you don't deteriorate that work you just paid good money for. Right. And again, all this comes back to communication. If you're not, you know, the management company, the manager should be helping communicate all this with your owners um, so that, you know, these things can be coordinated and, and, and done properly. Um, some people were asked about escalation rates for budget material costs due to current inflation. Obviously, it's going to be dependent on the material and type of job, but can you kind of give us a, a broad range of inflation factors that you're seeing right now, Ben, between, you know, this year and a year or two ago? I mean, it's, it's insane right now. I mean, just look at a, go buy a two by four, go buy a sheet of plywood compared that to if you had to do that a year ago. I mean, some of these cases at, at its peak, they've doubled right. for a variety of different reasons. I have certain projects that are roof projects that are waiting for insulation boards for six months as a lead time, lead time. And that has active roof leaks. So it is all over the place, unfortunately, and it's out of a lot of people's control. But one thing I can go ahead and say with, with a pretty good degree of confidence is that although it seems as though we may be at a peak right now, it's still probably going to be cheaper to go ahead and do your work now than it will be tomorrow or the next day or the next day. There will always be some reason to not go ahead and do some repair, whether it's hurricane season, whether it's price of material or labor. But the difference that we're talking about, if you fast forward a year from now, is just going to be a few percentage points. So do it now. I and mean, you're only going to be causing more damage to your building if you don't do it. All right. Someone asked, what's the best way to find a competent engineer architect to provide an inspection? I mean, that's where you got to rely on your management company and, uh, and your association attorney. We, we've both uh, been in this industry a long time. We're very familiar with who the reputable vendors are and, and who they're not and, and who just showed up yesterday. And um, you, you, know, you really want to get professional recommendations in those areas because of the, the size, scope, and 
scale of these projects. Michael, any thoughts on that? Just that it's more of an issue now than ever, because um, obviously there is a high demand right now for structural engineers here in, in the state of Florida. Um, I think that I probably sent out as many engineering list recommendations to my clients in the month after Surfside as I probably did in, in the several years before that. Um, it just, it, it, was, it was an absolute tidal wave of requests because people are concerned. So you're gonna have a lot of fly-by-night people that are coming here to capitalize on the opportunity. That's why it's good to have somebody like Campbell that can help you see here's, you know, the big players that you can trust um, and do it again sooner rather than later. They're slammed right now and you want one of the good guys when you undertake a process like this. So start ASAP if you wanna line them up um, and get somebody that you'll really be comfortable with within the time frames that you need to implement your work. All right. Someone asked, Michael, could you state again the name of that case that was related to uh, the shutters? Uh, it, it's my favorite case because it actually flies in the face of the blog articles that are published by many of my colleagues in the condominium law world. It's called Pintuzzi. Uh, I think it's spelled P-I-N-T-U-Z-Z-I. And whoever that is out there in condo land, feel free to email me. I think that Ashley will be circulating contact information. And I'd be happy to provide you a copy of the case directly from Westlaw, which is our database that we use for pulling these types of things. So I uh, think the rest of these questions are, are very much related to people's individual circumstances. So I don't think we're going to get into those. Um, but so we, we ran a little over time. But at this point, I'd just like to say thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed our presentation. I hope you learned a thing or two. Uh, the contact information for everybody on this webinar is up here. Uh, so please feel free to email whichever of us you feel could most likely solve your problem. If you need management services, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, ben, obviously, uh, extremely uh, thorough, knowledgeable in the area of engineering, and I know their firm is taking on more work. And uh, we've worked from, with Michael for many years, and he's been a huge advocate for the uh, associations that we work with him on. So any parting words, gentlemen? Thank you very much for the opportunity. I really appreciate this. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, th thanks for putting it together, Evan. This was, I think, actually super valuable for people out there. I hope everyone that's attending found it to be that way. I thought it was particularly informative and mostly for the things that you two said. I was, eh, but we'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate your time, Michael. Thanks again, everybody, and uh, have a wonderful uh, rest of your Thursday.